Aiden, while the Swans rested up this week, the title of second best team in the league is up for grabs for just about anybody. Uh, we had another round of upsets, another set of um- ump- umpiring controversy, and now that we're halfway through the home and away season, I think this season, more than other seasons, really anything can happen in the second half. Welcome back to Chat Shit. You know what, before we get it, get into our, our normal segments, I just want to say I'm sick and tired of the best players not being tagged. I was watching Dacos run around by himself, and yes, I know the Bulldogs won against a smashed up Collingwood side, but I'm watching there run around, 32 touches, two goals, he's broken his record for clearances, he had 16 clearances. The Collingwood clearances. record for clearances. It was a Collingwood, the Collingwood record. And the Collingwood had, record for contested possessions. He had possessions. 25 first gets, straight out of the ruck. First gets, 25 first gets, that's the record for this season. 27 contested possessions, and I'm running, I'm, I'm watching him run around by himself. We saw Harley Reid dominate the first half. What happens? He gets tagged, he has three touches in the entire second half, went from 89 super coach points to around 70 points from half time to full time. I don't know if it's pride or anything, but you have to tag the best players. I'm sick and tired of seeing it every week. Let's jump into the top five players of the round. In number five, I have a young gun who has now just jumped into the frame for the Rising Star Award, Ollie Dempsey. Oh, I like it. I didn't have him in. He was absolutely huge for Geelong. Three goals and almost 30 touches as a guy who uh, starts on the half forward line, comes and gets involved around the midfield. He had such a massive impact uh, in a big win for Geelong when they've had four straight losses. Uh, it wasn't convincing for Geelong throughout the entire game, but Ollie Dempsey, well, he was consistent throughout that entire that entire match. Three 27 disposals, two goal assists as well. With when they needed someone to stand positions. up as well. Yeah, it was he, he he flew all over the ground and he flew all over the the stat sheet as well, and that was a really impressive display from a, uh, display from a guy in his first season. I like it. My number five is is Sam Switkowski. I think he had a really awesome game here. And he's sort of like when we had Alex Neil Bullen in our top five a few weeks ago. A lot of what he does goes unnoticed. He's a really good pressure forward. And when he gets when he gets touches, it's really damaging touches. He had 25 touches here. They're forward as half. As a small forward. As a small forward. That's, that's incredible. He uses the ball really well. Pressure. Uh, exactly, exactly what you want from, from a guy like that. And he had just a really unbelievable performance today. It'll be overshadowed by guys like Clark. He got 38 touches and Sarong. He got 30 touches. Fife had a good game as well. We just wanted to point out his performance today because I was really impressed. I know you love Sam Swikowski and you love those pressure forwards. And I, I think he deserves to be in there. In my number four, I have Jordan Clark. And he yeah. didn't just light up the stat sheet. He didn't just get cheapies at the back. He got a goal and two goal assists as a halfback flanker, 10 score involvements, and really took, I, I'm not sure how many intercept marks, except he would have had a lot of intercept possessions, the way that he just shut down Melbourne. Now, he wasn't the only one that dominated Melbourne today. It was just, we're going to get into it. I, I don't know how much we'll get into it later. Let's just talk about it now. A 92-point win. Um, Melbourne just, at home, not at the MCG. A 92-point loss to Freo. Melbourne haven't conceded over 110 points since the start of 2022, and they just got shipped for 140 <laughs> points. And keep in mind, they kicked the first two goals of this game, and mm. then it was over. That was it. And I didn't catch a lot of this game. I watched the highlights in post. But you were telling me... I was me watching it. One of the most dominant games you've seen in a while. Yeah, and Jordan Clark, I think... And we're going to get into in our next segment, but I think has been unbelievable this year. Uh, One of the best in his position in the league, and he was phenomenal today. I like it. I'll jump into my number four. And my next four guys from one to four are all guys that won the game for their team. So number four, I've got Mason Wood. He three goals in the fourth quarter. That's almost all I need to say, but four in total, a game changer in a struggling side, a side that really struggles to kick goals. King went out, and we saw a guy that's probably could be their best forward. He used to play forward in his um in his in his junior career. Maybe it's an option for them because they really struggled at, to actually kick more than nine goals. Won the game for for his team at the end there, and I just wanted to commend him on three goals in one quarter. I love that you gave him appreciation. It, it hurt me that I couldn't find a spot for him in my top five. So I think he absolutely deserves that appreciation. I saw a stat he's never had a three vote Brownlow performance, so I think that'll change wow. here. In my number three spot, I have Nick Dacos. Okay, I didn't have him in my top five. Unreal. I, he there broke the there Colling- are a lot of good performances this week. Collingwood Football Club has existed since the since the 1800s, since these stats have been taken, which I think is a lot more recent. He's broken the records for clearances and contested possessions. I know we don't do honourable mentions. I did have him there, <laughs> and I've just edged him out with Switkowski just because Collingwood lost. Yeah, Dacos's first half was was one of the all-time halves, and uh, then in the second half, he was, still, he was still really, really solid. Sometimes your team just can't get across the line, and Bulldogs were were really good and there was a guy that was a little bit better than Dacos. 
Yeah, I'll go my number three. Very similar to Mason Wood is Cripps. He didn't have a, a massive game in the first three quarters, but again, last quarter he really stood up and, and won the game for his team. Kicked two goals, led from the front. For about 10 minutes there, looked like, looked like the best player in the competition. Just want to commend him on that. Brought the game home for his team. Really dominant fourth quarter against, against Port Adelaide. Yeah, Jamie Cripps was pretty good with three goals and 14 against St Kilda, so fair they're, enough. They they've racked it up this there. week, the Cripps. <laughs> uh, in my number two, I've got that I suspect is your number two as well. It's Dylan Moore. I have his number one, actually. Unbelievable. You give him a talk. Yeah, so, wow. Like, five, five goals... He could have been more selfish and kicked more. We saw at the end there, I don't know if you're watching, but they were targeting Gunston mm. in, in his 250th. They had the 2014 Hawthorne Premiership side watching from the stands, and they were targeting him. He, he was running in 50, could have easily slotted a sixth, probably could have had a seventh, but he just lowered the eyes every single time and, and found his teammates. Uh, he had 27 disposals as well, uh, two yeah. goal assists. He's having a quietly having a potential All Australian season. We're going to get into that soon. Ooh, I don't know if he's quite there. I don't know. But he's been. He, he's a sneaky yeah. if he keeps the form up at the moment. But he's the way he comes up from half forward and 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 makes is, is damaging at, at the stoppage, but also gets in behind and kicks the goals. Uh, there aren't too many players like him in the competition. When he's at his best, he's a very similar player in my eyes to Tom Papley when he's firing. Yeah. The way that he can burst out of stoppage and just provide all that energy and class up forward. I think they're quite similar players, actually. He's having, I think he's having a real breakout year, Dylan Moore. Yeah. Potential, yeah, potential All-Australian come the end of the year. Not not quite yet. Hawthorne have to give him enough chances to get some goals and score involvements. I'll say my number two, I reckon, is your number one in Marcus Bontempelli. The Bont. You want, to, you want to tell us about him? I mean, yeah. But I said Nick Dacos broke all sorts of Collingwood midfield records and Pont was a class above him. Uh, so two goals, 38 and nine tackles with eight score involvements. Ten clearances. Ten clearances. contested possessions. Goal assist. Three free kicks, four none against. Those are the stats. But we know with the Bont that he is one of those guys that is better than his stats because he's so classy on the ball. He's a leader and he led the Bulldogs to a crucial win. We know that they have been one of the better teams in the league in the last five or six weeks, except they were five and six before this week with this 120 percentage. And they needed this win, this upset win against Collingwood, and the Bont led them. He was just all over the ground. He was everywhere. Massive in the last quarter as well. When you talk about guys not being tagged equally, I think Collingwood should have stuck. They have so many young guys there. Just get your worst player in and give, give him a run with. Yeah. It's, it's not that hard. So many guys there that would be desperate to be keeping their spots when all of Collingwood's midfielders come back. Surely one of them says, if this is what I need to do to keep my spot, just let me let me run with the bond. 100%. Um, 100%. We'll move on and we'll go into our next segment, which is our rolling All-Australian teams. So we're halfway through the year, and I think this is a great time to assess who have been the star players in the league so far. Let's start at my back line. I've got Alex Pierce, Sam Taylor, and Dane Rampey. In my half back line, I've got Jordan Clark, Nick Blakey, and Mac Andrew. Wow, we have, we have some we have some differences here. Wow. <laughs> in my centre line, I have Errol Goulden, Chad Warner, and Zach Merritt. And in my followers, I've got Max Gorn, Isaac Heaney, and Nick Dacos. In my for- half forward line, Brian Myers, Ben King, and Christian Petrarca. In my forward line, Rankin, Charlie Kerno, and Jesse Hogan. And then on my interchange, four midfielders: Paddy Cripps. Marcus Bontempelli, Zach Butters, and Caleb Sorrell. We do have a few a few differences here, as, as expected. Do you want to do you want to talk about anyone? Mac Andrew, I think, is someone that not a lot of people that's, have that's in their team. Shout! I didn't even consider him at all. People have been talking about him a lot as one of the most improved players in the league. Maybe Jake Waterman alongside him is the two most improved players this year. But I think he's been better than just a breakout star. He's been potentially the best centre half back in the league. Uh, he is so athletic and has shown that he's good with the ball. He's averaging about 20 disposals, distributing beautifully for Gold Coast, and he's a really composed decision maker to go with the fact that he just crashes every pack phenomenally and takes intercept marks. I think he's been the best centre-half back in the league. I like the, I like the call. I don't have him, but I'll, I'll get into my team now. At full-back, I have Zach Guthrie, Harris Andrews, and, and Luke Ryan. The half-back <laughs> line, I have Nick Blakey, Sam Taylor, and, and Jacob Wiedering. In the centre, I have Errol Gordon, Zach Merritt, and Josh Dacos. Followers, Max Gorn, Isaac Heaney, Nick Dacos. Half forward line, Grian Myers, Ben King, Christian Petrarca. Full forward, I had Jake Waterman, Charlie Kerno, and Isaac Rankin. And in the interchange, I had Caleb Sarong, Marcus Bontempelli, Chad Warner, and Patrick Cripps. Six differences in our 22. Six differences. All right, well, I think Zach Guthrie's having a really underrated season. I think... 
the way I've I've heard some of the Geelong play, players talk about him and the impact he's having, mm. especially with the most the recent run of form. He's been really impactful, taking a lot of intercept marks. I don't think you had Harris Andrews in there. I had him in until I put Mac Andrews. I just I just had a look at the mo- he has the most intercept yeah. marks, most contested marks for a key defender. I think. He's been tagged a lot this year just because of how good he is, and I think he's still being able to put up these sort of stats, so I just have to commend him on that. Um, who else Who else did I have? Wait, here? the one player I want to shout out from my team, while you think, is Dane Rampey. I, while the Swans have been by far the best team in the league, so I don't think it's unfair that I have five Swans in here, but I think Dane Rampey is a player that I don't think Melbourne media and Melbourne AFL people will think of as an All-Australian selection, but I still think he's just about the best lockdown s- s- back pocket in the league he can defend small and tall and is just phenomenal and has been just about the best at that this year i like it how many dif- how many differences did you say we had six six differences i reckon we'll do this again in in a few weeks maybe mm. towards the end of the season uh as the season keeps continues to play out but yeah those are our rolling all australian teams for now we'll move on to our next segment of hits and misses i can get behind players not getting a brown low if they get a suspension because it's the best and fairest award that's fair enough you have to be, do the fair part as well rising star i do not think you should be ineligible if you get a suspension we've seen this week the the tackle that harley reed made and he will get a suspension at least one week and he'll miss out on the rising star i don't think this should have anything to do with uh, them missing weeks we're talking about young guys who have just come into the league these harsh rules and, and he's been by far the best player and Sam Darcy's been by far the second best and he's likely to get suspended as well and miss weeks 100% and we're just going to we'll come to the to Brownlow night at the end of the year when they announce eventually announce the rising star and we're not going to see guys a Harley Reid we're not going to see a, a, a Darcy in there as well just wanted to say that I don't think they should be ineligible if they do miss a week for this rising star award it's not the best and fairest yeah it's a, it's a t- tough position to be in for the AFL except I think it's fair enough that they're having this crackdown more suspensions easier to get suspended because they're trying to get rid of this head injury issue with everything coming out about it however if you're going to make it so easy to get suspended with sometimes you have tackles that don't have bad intention except they end up slinging a bloke on his head and the guy gets suspended I just think if you're going to crack down on suspensions then maybe have some leeway when it comes to rising star eligibility so I agree with that for my miss I think it's the umpiring. It's what everyone's talking about, but it really is a miss just how involved umpires are making themselves. It's also, I think, how inconsistent it is yep. across the different games. I don't think they understand the holding the ball rule anymore. They don't. Like, I, I know it's your miss, but I think from game to game, I was really confused at the interpretation of the holding the ball. And the first game of the round, I remember I saw four holding the balls in about six minutes. A few weren't holding the balls at all. As soon as they get the ball, they get smashed. They've got an arm that's just free. They, they've got uh, two guys on them and they're getting pinned for holding the ball. And then we see other ones like the Nick Dacos one, which wasn't called, which was a, a big one for this round. And there were other ones which were the same as ones we saw in the first game, but they were being called in the last game of the round. So yeah, I'm not really sure of the rules. The only thing I'd add to that um, is that blokes are also being penalized for going for the footy. I think there are occasions where it, the, with the whole dive on it rule, that needs to be made clear because there are times where there's a contested footy no one's going for it because you know if you grab that ball you're likely to be tackled and then it's up to the umpire's discretion where he's whether he's going to say that you are holding the ball and because blokes don't know what the rule is and they can't trust consistent umpiring but yeah. like, let's move on to the hits yeah my hit the flag hawks i think after sydney i reckon the second most exciting team in the competition they bring pressure they bring really exciting ball movement Weddle off the back is like nick blakey cloned at, <laughs> at the way he's playing at the moment they have talent if they continue down this road, I reckon they're a sneaky for the top eight. If they continue how they're playing now. Um, they, four from their last five, with the only loss being that tragic one-point loss against Port. They need to take a couple scalps, because they have had a couple of easy games here. But if they can start beating teams that are in the eight, I reckon they're a sneaky. But I love, I love watching this team. And Will Day has brought such a spark coming back from his well, preseason I mean, injury. The form's come about since, since he's come back into the side. Yeah, I think he's... He's going to be the real star of this young core out of Newcomb, Warple, and himself. He's that real superstar potentially to come out of that team. I love that hit, and I've been loving watching the Hawks. My hit, while we talked about the miss that they're not being tagged, I loved the matchup of Bontempelli versus Dacos. It was two of the best players in the competition. The the guy who's currently on the throne, maybe, in Bontempelli against Dacos, the up-and-coming future Brownlow medalist and future, future best player in the league. It reminded me of... Famous matchups that I used to get so excited for. Dangerfield versus Fife. 
Ablett versus Young Pendlebury, these sorts of matchups, that's what it felt like. And it was just awesome to see two guys going at it. It was from the first bounce, wasn't it? Yeah. Two heavyweights going, going, <laughs> going at each other. I, I absolutely love it. Yeah. I love that. We'll jump into the next segment, which is the, the, the awaited footy pyramid. There are a lot of changes in the footy pyramid this week. A lot of players had good games. A lot of people didn't have great games. A lot of people lost out to the bye. We'll get into it now. We have two outs. Jordan Dawson, really quiet game, was shoved forward, didn't have really any impact in the game. He's out of the pyramid. We know how hard it is to stay in. Tough world. Tom Green has lost, lost out to the bye. He was on the fringes of the top 15 last week. He's now been, he's now been pushed out. Which means we have two new ins, starting at both in the in the fifth tier. Sam Walsh is back in the pyramid. He, he, he took a couple of weeks off and, and, and he's back here. And Luke Ryan is, is now in the pyramid. Incredibly consistent. And I, I, I don't think I've seen guys at, at full back put, put up numbers like him in a season game after game after game after game. Intercept marks, a real quarterback for that, for, for that Fremantle side. Nick Blakey holds his spot. Max Scorn moves down to the fifth tier. Was absolutely hammered by Shrek and Luke Jackson that game. <laughs> and Zach Butters moves down to the fifth tier. In the fourth tier. Charlie Kerner. Charlie Kerner's <laughs> not in the fourth tier. Oh. Caleb Sarong moves up from the fifth tier, now in the fourth tier. Christian Petrarca looked like the only shining light-ish for that team. Looked like he was trying his best out there, put up some decent numbers. He moves up from the fifth tier to the fourth tier. Errol Goulden moves down a tier. He's lost out to the bye, it happens. And Zach Merritt moves down a tier. In the third tier, finally moving after 11 rounds this year is Charlie Kerno. The most consistent guy in the, in, in the pyramid, holding a spot in the fourth tier from the first week to the 11th week, he's now moved up. Just consistent performer every week. I think he's the best forward in the competition. And yeah, I think he deserves, de- deserves to move up. Chad Warner has moved down. He's lost out to the bye. It happens. What can you do? He's, been, he's had two straight performances where he's been the best player in the league. That's how tough it is to stay, <laughs> stay at that, that I can't get level behind that. I can't in, get in the behind pyramid. that. You'll see he's moved up. You probably already know. <laughs> Cripps has moved up to the third tier as well. Being a consistent performer, great captain, love the work. In the second tier, Nick Dacos holds a spot, another class performance, and Marcus Bontempelli is the replacement for Chad Warner. Had an elite performance and has a, has been an elite performer this season. We is going to get all Australian and deserves to move up into the second tier. And on top, not losing to the bye. He's been the most dominant player this season so far is, is Isaac Heaney. The pyramid's sitting in front of you here. Let me know if you'd make any changes and if I should stop making people lose to the bye. Justice for Chad Warner. But let's move on to the power rankings. The power rankings are just an absolute shambles at the moment. My head was fried because who goes at number two? There's no team that you can justifiably put it to at the moment. And then there are certain teams that I'm going to have maybe 11 or 12 who are top four on the ladder because the vibes right now are so muddled. You have a team like Melbourne that looked like a really solid top four shout uh, about 48 hours ago, and then they've just lost by 100 points. So we don't know what's going on in this league right now. Really anything can happen in the second half of the season, but this is going to reflect where I think teams sit and who is impressing the most. In 18th, we have North. Uh, I don't know how many more jokes I can make with this extended metaphor of the rent they're paying in 18th, but I'll come up with a new one for next week. They had the buy this week, which has been their best result yet. <laughs> in 17th, I have Richmond. Put in another <laughs> decent performance, to be fair to them. And McKelty Lafau, unfortunately, did his ACL in the game. Unfortunate. In 16th, I have St Kilda. They, they were good and got their first win in a long time. But in the words of Shania Twain, that don't impress me much. Score more than 90 points if you want to go up above 16th. God, that flow was awful. <laughs> that, in 15th, I've got West Coast. That don't impress <laughs> me much. They lost to St. Kilda, but I believe they're still ahead of them on the ladder. Let's confirm that. Yes, they are. No, they're not. They're one behind them. I don't care. West Coast are a much more fun team. They have capacity you to do You love the vibes. Great. Jake Waterman was out. They probably win that if he's in as well. Yeah. And yeah. Tim Kelly and Jake Waterman both laid outs. I think they have a much higher ceiling than this St. Kilda team this year. Damn, that's tough to hear as a St. Kilda fan. <laughs> in 14th, I have Adelaide. Who dropping three spots. Dropping three spots after a, a loss. that they, they really needed that win against Hawthorne. They were potentially... This was maybe their last chance to make a charge towards the eight, and, and they missed that chance. In 13th, I have Brisbane, who had a bye. And this is sort of where they sit. Uh, at the bottom of the of the tier of teams that are fighting to potentially claw in a top eight spot. They just have not been consistent this year and had a really poor start. In 12th, I have Gold Coast. 
and it's they're seven and five now, and they're unbeaten at home. Except I feel uncomfortable putting them any higher than twelfth if they cannot get a win away from home. It's just the reality that you're not going to go far if you're un- if you're one of the worst teams in the league when you're away from home. So I'm really interested to see what happens in the next few weeks now that they have really their best chance in the club's history to make finals. Petition for the AFL Grand Final to be, <laughs> be all the people first stadium. stadium. <laughs> hey, in that case, I'd have them a lot higher. In 11th, I have Geelong. And they sit, I believe, top four on the ladder. I'll, I'll check that later. But they, in their last five games, they've had four losses. They're third. Yep, four losses and then an unconvincing win against Richmond. They're third on the ladder because of their start to the year. But when it comes to their current form and how they currently look at a team... As a team, I don't think their midfield holds up. They got away with it against Richmond, maybe the only midfield in the league who was worse than the Geelong midfield at the moment. The Geelong, the Geelong North. midfield was getting hammered for about two and a half quarters there. Yep. They have a really tough run coming up. They got Sydney, yep. Carlton, Essendon, Hawthorne, Collingwood in their next five. Geelong have a tough run. It'll be a big challenge. It fe- like Some people will see this and think that this is silly to have Geelong at 11, but they are still in poor form and they need... I don't think they will, except they need to find some spark in that midfield against a good team if they want to get themselves in the top eight come the end of the year. In 10th, I have Melbourne. Now, I had them in the top four last week. You third. have been third. What can you do after a 92-point loss in a home game? Embarrassing. It's What can you really do? It was just, from start to finish, an absolute trampling. And they're one of those teams... They sit in that category of teams now that you don't know what to think about them because they've been, for the last however many years, four or five years, uh, a team that's been consistently a top four shout, a premiership shout, and that's what I guess we assume of them this year. But I don't know if that's now in doubt after that performance. In number nine, I have another team that currently sits in the top four in Port Adelaide. They have not been convincing. They've just had a, a loss that they'll find really disappointing against Carlton. And while Carlton had a really good performance, I think Port, as we've said throughout the year, cannot put together a win against a good team. They cannot get a win against a fellow premiership contender, which they want to see themselves as, and they just don't seem to have it in those big games. I think all of their wins have been in those games against teams that are not contending for a premiership. In eighth, I have have Carlton, who sit in fifth on the ladder. And this is... It's, it's so strange, the positioning of these teams on, on my power rankings. But I think Carlton, we know that they've been struggling for form and that was a big win against Port Adelaide. So I've jumped them a few spots on the power rankings and let's see if they can keep rising from there. In seventh, and this is a huge riser, I have Hawthorne. Okay, if, I like it, I like it. Maybe, I, I don't think it's at all silly to have them this high, maybe even higher. They've won four of their last five games. You don't want to play them at the moment. You do not want to play this Hawthorne team. They are scary. It's what they looked like in the uh, last six weeks of last year, and it's it's awesome for the league, I think. In sixth, I have the Bulldogs, who got a huge win against Collingwood. They're now 6-6, six and six, but with the third best percentage in the league, this is a time that they need to charge because they are in good form, they're firing, uh, and I think despite that Sam Darcy injury and and a potential Aaron Norton injury, which is a bit of a downer, um, I think that team is looking really good and they need to start piling some wins together and getting behind the bots. In fifth, I have Collingwood moving down a few spots, um, who this was their first loss since round three, but they've had two draws in there as well, and they just haven't been uh, looking as dominant in the last couple of weeks. A draw against Fremantle and then a loss against the Bulldogs. They are smashed by injuries, to be fair. But yeah, yep. this is form and vibes. Yep, they are smashed by injuries. I still do think, in my eyes, they're my second fancy to win the league after the Swans or potentially third fancy alongside GWS once they have everyone fit. Uh, but for now, they go down to fifth. In fourth, I have Essendon, who go up a spot with the loss. And I think a Gold Coast at home is, is not Gold Coast. It's a different beast. Uh, it's like the Hulk when he's a man and when he's the Hulk. And wow, that was, that was tough. <laughs> tough to listen to? Yeah. Okay, wow. we won't edit that out. I stand by it. Uh, but I think they've earned this. I sh- probably should have had them up here earlier because they've been amongst teams that have not had any consistency. They have had consistency. And while they lost this game, I think it's another consistent performance where they stuck to their identity. There, there was a lot of pressure throughout the game. In third, I have GWS, who win to the bye, because <laughs> uh, I think the teams around them just, uh, you know, you had a lot of teams uh, faltering, but whether that be Collingwood, 
a loss to Essendon, uh, the Melbourne display. So GWS, I think, are poised. This buy came at the right time. They're poised to, to shoot up. They run into Hawthorne next. Which will be an awesome game. I'll yeah. make sure to cut my eyes There's on that. ball movement on ball movement for both teams. You see who I have in second, and it's Flag Mantle with a huge Seven. jump. Wow. Okay, fair enough. Massive victory. We cannot say that this is just a team which is holding on and beating bad teams. They have gotten huge scalps, and this was comprehensive. I don't know what excuse to make for them for Melbourne other than the fact that Frio were 92 points better. We know that their midfield is good. We know that their defense is maybe one of the best in the league, just behind the Swans. But this game, they showed that they can score 140 points against a solid defense. And I guess that's been the question with Frio. Can they put together... Can their forwards do it? Can their forwards do it? And if we look through their forwards, Sam Switkowski was awesome. Absolutely awesome. A goal, 25. One of the best players of the round. Jai missed kicked four. Jackson kicked three. Tracy kicked three. Walters kicked three. Not only did Walters kick three, he was electric. He was creative. And he... I, Whenever he touched the ball, he was just tearing apart that Melbourne defense. So this team... If they can put up offensive displays like that, they are a threat to the rest of the league. And in one, sitting on their laurels with this bye is, is the Swans, and there is a huge gap. They didn't lose the, the bye? They smashed the bye. Smashed the bye. Came at the, came at the perfect time. I don't know everything's the perfect time right now for the Swans because they're doing everything right, and they sit in first place. I like it. Those are the power rankings. Thanks for listening to the podcast, and we'll see you all in the next one. See ya.